which is tune number 178. We sing at the end in verse 22, Now ye that God forget, this carefully consider, lest I in pieces tear you all, and none can you deliver. Whoso doth offer praise, me glorifies, and I will show him God's salvation that orders right his way. We'll sing together verses 19 to 23. Stand for prayer. Almighty God in heaven, you are a God who is to be feared. We confess that left to ourselves, we would think that you are altogether like unto us, as we have just sung. But you have shown us yourself. You have revealed yourself to us in your word. You have caused us to behold your majesty. We see that you are a just and righteous God and that you rule and reign with divine authority over all the sons of men as the creator of heaven and earth. You are the judge of both the just and the unjust, the God who will bring and assemble the mass of humanity in the last day to give an account before you for every idle word uttered in the flesh. And so, Lord, we would bow down with fear and worship you and give you glory. You are light. You are the source of of light that illuminates uh, this world. You are the one who has called your people from darkness to light to make them uh, to walk before you as, as children of light in this world. We confess, O Lord, that your tender mercies are over all of your your works. We pray that as we have already heard this day, that you would let uh, your peace to rule in our hearts and minds, and that you would cause uh, your law to be implanted deep in our our souls, that it would be our meditation uh, day and night. We ask, O Lord, that you would give us a heart that is 
uh, pledge with loyalty unto you that while there are many in this world that would cry out that they would not have this king to rule over them, uh, may we be given such a spirit as to say, indeed, Christ is king and Lord, and we would welcome, O Lord, your rule, that you would subdue us to yourself and that you would, and that you would govern and guide us in, in all of our ways. O Lord, we confess that only fools uh, mock at sin. And we, O Lord, see that those who do come uh, to ultimately discover their error to see it too late, whereas you have for your people made it to appear in its true colors. O Lord, grant that we would not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom we are sealed to the day of redemption. Lord, we ask that you would instead forgive us for our, our many, many sins, that you would help us to uh, walk with humility, to, to humble ourselves before you, uh, to be clothed with the, the grace of humility, which is so beautiful uh, to you and beautiful to, to your people. We thank you, O Lord, that there is a cross, that there is a crucified Savior to whom we can resort uh, to find the full forgiveness of our sins. We pray that for his glory's sake, you would cleanse us from our, our sin. Cause us, O Lord, all of our days to walk with you and before you. Cause the hoary head to be given a crown of, of glory uh, that they, that we from youth uh, to advanced years would love the righteousness of, of the Lord. And we ask that you would do great things for us, that you would tread down Satan under our feet, as you have promised, that you would crucify the lusts that are in us, uh, that you would make us to see the old man crucified uh, with Christ, that we might not serve uh, sin, that the world would be crucified to us and us to the world, that you would fit and prepare us for death and judgment and eternity, that we would have grace to live as if this were our last day, and that we would be given dying grace uh, to die, commending our spirits uh, unto you, the eternal God. We ask that you would bless uh, the congregation. We pray that you would awaken those who are sleepy and spiritually careless, uh, that, you would, uh, that you would arrest them and that you would be pleased to convict them and to drive them from the precipice into the safety of, of the harbor that is found in, in Christ. We pray that you would likewise strengthen the weak and those who are faltering, that you would grant uh, knees which would be firmed up and hearts which would be uh, calmed and made placid, that you would cause uh, your abundant love for your people uh, to be pressed home upon weary hearts uh, persuading them and quickening them with a sense of your love, that the love of Christ might constrain all of us in our service uh, of you. We pray for your blessing upon the uh, Presbytery's Family Conference. Bless, O oh Lord, the ministers who are preparing, uh, who are preparing their addresses. Uh, grant them the help of the Holy Spirit and a full, a full heart and uh, a full blessing in their labor that they might bring uh, food, uh, spiritual food for souls to, to feed upon. We ask that what is prepared with the Spirit's ministry might also be proclaimed uh, in the Spirit's ministry, that it might come forth with strength and power to the conversion of sinners and that it might be a means of equipping and furnishing your people for all that is necessary to walk in the good works which you have prepared for them. 
We ask, O God, that you would uh, bless us as a congregation, that you would put a hedge of of protection about us, that you would give your angels charge over us, that you would defend us against the wiles of the devil, that you would defend us against our own erring, unbelieving, and proud hearts, that you would uh, grant that peace would abound in in, in um, Zion, and that your people might be enabled to walk with peace and felicity. Uh, we ask for the church as, as a whole. We are grieved by seeing Zion rent asunder and so many uh, divisions, and uh, we, uh, we are humbled, O oh Lord, to see the Uh, the great shattering and scattering of of your church. We desire for uh, you to send forth your spirit and your word uh, to heal uh, what is broken, to repair the breaches, to restore uh, where there has been division, to bring uh, unity in the bonds of the gospel, uh, that you would give a measure of of reform and and reviving of your your church in in this manner. Bless us in our worship this afternoon. We ask, uh, we plead with you, let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart uh, be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We'll continue to sing together from Psalm 139 and verses 7 to 12. The tune is Ayrshire, which is number 25, tune 25. We saw in the opening section that God is an all-seeing, all-knowing God. That's reinforced in what follows in the, path, in the portion that we're singing now. We see that God is also omnipresent. He is everywhere present. From thy spirit, whither shall I go? Or from thy presence fly, send I heaven, lo, thou art there, there if in hell I lie, and so on, through verse 12.
Let us worship God by reading together in his word from 2 Kings chapter 4. Second Kings, the fourth chapter. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? She said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons and brought the vessels to her, who who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed uh, to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually, Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among mine own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel, And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, uh, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God uh, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, 
for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again uh, to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. And he went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, set on the great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds his lap full and came and shred them uh, into the pot of pottage for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot and they could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot. And he said, Pour out for the people, that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. And there came a man from Baal Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, What, should I set this before a hundred men? He said again, Give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, They shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them, and they did eat and left thereof, according to the word of the Lord. Amen. May God bless this reading of his Holy Word. We continue to lift up our hearts to the Lord in singing praise from Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. The tune is Balfour, which is number 27. Tune number 27. Psalm 139. Uh, verses 13 to 16, we see here that from conception, the Lord sees and knows uh, of those in their mother's womb. So life begins at conception, and the Lord considers uh, those who are in their, their mother's wombs as that which is fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's sing verses 13 to 16.
Our New Testament reading is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him, albeit Jesus suffered him not, But saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and begun to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Uh, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. A certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain 
which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Amen. Thus far, the reading of God's word. This afternoon we come to 2 Kings chapter 4 in our exposition of this Old Testament book. And we'll be considering together verses 1 to 7, which we've already read together. 2 Kings chapter 4, the opening section of this chapter, verses 1 to 7 which begins with these words, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. The title of our sermon is Divine Help. One of the realities that we face in this world one difficulty is that unbelievers, the, the, the condition of unbelievers is always far worse than they think. And on the flip side, the condition of believers is far better than they usually realize or think. Even in our deepest, darkest peril, God is with us and for us. Over the next three chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, we have a string of accounts given to us in redemptive history of the power of God through the ministry of Elisha. We're going to see one instance after another, God showing the strength of his right arm on behalf of men and in the presence of the world and all to his, his glory. It opens with this first account in in 2 Kings 4, verses 1 to 7. And really the theme of these seven verses is that Jehovah provides divine help to the helpless. The whole message here uh, brings to the fore the fact that Jehovah provides divine help for those that are helpless. So we'll look at three things. First of all, our helplessness. First of all, our helplessness. Verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Clearly, the woman is in desperate straits. She feels acutely her helplessness. First of all, she has been widowed. So she is left with the grief of having lost uh, her beloved husband and a godly husband at that. She's left vulnerable as a result of his being taken from this world. What she would then have leaned on in terms of Uh, worldly and earthly means, her two sons are now also being taken. So normally she would have looked to her two sons. They would have been the means of support, right? They would have been protecting her and going out to uh, provide for her and for the family as a whole. 
and we hear that they're being hauled, if it, they're being hauled off into slavery to pay debt. So this is all part of the provision of God's law, and they are having to go pay off uh, the debts of the family. So the woman is destitute. The woman is desperate. The woman is helpless. And this, this seeming destitution comes with really dismal prospects in the world. Where is she to go and what is she to do in order to survive these circumstances? Now we read in verse 1 that her husband had been faithful to Jehovah. He was a God-fearing man. He had been faithful to Jehovah, faithful to the, the purity of God's worship, in the day, in a day of deep, dark spiritual declension. So you know, the, you know the historic context because we've been working our way through it. Here is a man that is swimming against the tide of what everyone else around him was doing. Here was a man who was willing to risk all. Remember the cost, the sacrifices often associated with these. Ahab had gone on a killing spree trying to root out and destroy all of those who were faithful to Jehovah. In the northern kingdom generally, you had this state-sponsored state secretism, right? This corrupted form of religion and worship, which was centered at Bethel. And here's a man who fears the Lord. In the midst of all of that, he's walking with the Lord, before the Lord, and seeking to honor the Lord. Now, if you're, if you're putting the pieces together... What do you see? Here, here is what you would think of as a model family. Here's a God-fearing family, a godly family, a faithful family, and yet they are thrust into this terrible circumstance. Right? Here they are experiencing a disaster. You would have thought to yourself perhaps, well, you know, these are the godly people. They'll They'll be given strength and help and so on. You know, it's the, it's the ungodly people that have to suffer these things. Well, hopefully you don't think along those foolish lines because that is entirely out of accord with what the Bible teaches. The godly often suffer and the most faithful often suffer under extraordinary difficulties. We see it today. You know, a person's house burns to the ground. Maybe a God-fearing person their house burns, or someone dies of cancer, or part of the family is taken away uh, in, an, in a car accident, and so on. And so there's this, this tension, perhaps. You, you can almost feel it in the text. It says, see how these things are put back to back, thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come. Thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come. And yet, in the midst of this helplessness, we see an exercise of genuine saving faith in this woman. You say, well, where is that, Pastor? It's in the opening words. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha. She, in the midst of her desperate circumstances, has gone crying to Elisha, which is another way of saying she is crying to the Lord. She is coming to God's, to Jehovah's spokesman with these trials. And she is, as it were, bringing her whole case and laying it before the Lord. Notice she doesn't come and say, here are my demands. My husband was a God-fearing man. He was one of the sons of the prophets. Here are my demands. She doesn't say, here are my demands expectations. Here are the solutions that I think need to be followed in order to get me out of this predicament. She does nothing of the sort. She merely comes and humbly, believingly, lays her whole case before the Lord. It's like Martha, as we saw in John 11, when she comes to the Lord Jesus and says, uh, he whom thou lovest is sick. She's just laying it before the Lord, laying the thing before the Lord, or to use the language a little bit later uh, in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20 at the end of, of verse 
12, which are words that ought to be taken up by us from, from time to time. It says, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Right? This, this is the spirit in which this woman is coming. She's casting her burdens upon the Lord. She's bringing her helplessness to the Lord. And she is met, mind you, with covenant privileges. She's received with covenant privileges. Notice Elijah, Elisha's response. Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? Do you see the eagerness? Elisha is saying, I know you and I hear your circumstances and I am ready to do anything and everything I can on your behalf. There's an eagerness uh, for him to help. This is a covenant privilege that is given to the Lord's believing people. It's not the response that you see from Elisha just one chapter earlier. Remember in chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, where we have Jehoram coming uh, to Elisha for help. And Elisha said unto the king, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And then Elisha says to him, As the Lord of hosts, verse 14, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. Right? We just heard this in the last sermon. So the reception this woman is getting is not just standard cookie cutter, what everyone gets when they come to the Lord or come to his prophet, Elisha. This woman has access. This woman has access to Jehovah in her time of trouble. And so she has helplessness, but she has access to the God who is able uh, to help. And in that sense, by way of application, we are not merely to look at what we don't have. Don't sit there and fixate on what you don't have. You are to see what you do have in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is an audience with the King of Heaven. Remember he, the words of Hebrews, we are able to come boldly before Him in our time of need, we're to come to the throne of grace. This is a privilege that the Lord has given to everyone who is an adopted son or daughter of the living God. And the Psalms are full of this sort of response. In Psalm 142, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. This is a covenant privilege. This is not for everyone. This belongs to the Lord's people. The fact that we're even able in our helplessness to go to him is a profound mercy. So first of all, we see our helplessness. Secondly, we see our hope. Secondly, our hope. Picking up with verse 2. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out, and it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Here we see, secondly, our hope. As you come to passages like this, as you come to any passage in these Old Testament narratives, one of the first questions you're, you're to be asking yourself is, How is God revealing himself to his people? both initially and originally and permanently and ongoingly to us uh, throughout the ages. How is God revealing himself as a redeemer uh, uh, to his, his people? 
because that's precisely what God is doing in these texts. We never take these passages and then turn them into three moral steps that'll be good, good uh, pointers for success in the world, right? We're looking to see where is God to be found? Where is Christ set forth in these passages? And it's true not only in the text, but in our circumstances as well, right? This woman in the midst of her world crashing down over her head, she's looking to find the Lord in her circumstances, which is why she's gone to the Lord, to his servant, his prophet, Elisha. We are in our circumstances to be eyeing the hand of the Lord. We're to be looking to see the Lord. We study him in his word. We also study him in his works, creation, providence, and redemption. And we we're to, we're, to, we're to be seeking to find the Lord in the circumstances, in the ways in which he is his dealing with us. So uh, Elisha responds to her by saying, what hast thou in the house? And she says basically nothing. She says, I have nothing except, except a pot of oil, a single pot of oil. So the emphasis in the text is on the paucity of her resources. That's the emphasis. Right? There are some who come to this text and view it as potential. Oh, she has, a, she has this pot of oil. Well, look at the potential that's to be found in this pot of oil. Think of all that can be done you know, with this pot of oil. That's not where the emphasis is falling in the passage. The emphasis is falling on how destitute she is the paucity of her resources. And the reason that's important is because God begins, in dealing with his people, he begins with our meager inadequacies. He begins with our meager inadequacies. He he even forces us at times to see our helplessness in order to redirect our gaze to where our hopefulness is to be grounded. Remember, in the New Testament, the account of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus doesn't say to the disciples, you know, is what you have enough? Do you have enough for what we need? That's not what he says. He says, how many loaves of fishes do you have? And they say, five. Five loaves, two fishes. That's all we have. And the Lord is saying that's exactly. Everybody needs to own this is where we are. This is, the, this is the circumstances. We have next to nothing. And it was out of that that the Lord was pleased to multiply the loaves and fishes to feeding the 5,000 with 12 baskets of leftovers beyond that. In verses 3, 4, and the beginning of verse 5, this concept of our hope is, is um, strengthened, but in an interesting way. God tells her through Elisha that she's to take these empty vessels and go into her house and shut the door. So what's happening? God is actually concealing the event behind closed doors. Obviously, she has to go out to collect vessels, and there's some publicity in that, having to go house to house, borrow vessels uh, from her, her neighbor. But by and large, the event is being conducted behind closed doors. In other words, it is not always God's intention to make a public spectacle of his provisions. So there are the occasions like the feeding of the 5,000 where it is public or the healing of legion, the Gadarene, and other such things. But there are also many occasions when the Lord is pleased uh, to rather bring a private token of love to his people. And in doing so, he's still magnifying himself, right? When, when he's done great things, like causing the Jordan to be parted so that the prophets could walk through on dry ground and the other prophets were, over, were, were observing this, God is being magnified in that. It's true. God is no less magnified when he's bringing private tokens of love to his people. It also has a way of strengthening the fact that this is really about what the Lord is doing with us and for us and not about us. Sometimes in public events, 
it can become very much about us. Look at what God is doing with me, in me, for me, before the watching world. And all, all, uh, all of a sudden, subtly perhaps, it becomes our story and a story about us rather than a story about the greatness and grandeur of God himself. And so the Lord is magnifying himself uh, in, in this situation in a private, private setting. In verses 5 and 6, we read that the woman did not answer him back. She didn't protest. She didn't qualify. She didn't ask for uh, further, further details. Rather, she went from him and did what he said. So the Lord was requiring obedience of her, and she gave complete obedience. She followed what the Lord was requiring of her. So this is, her obedience is actually a tangible expression of her trust in the Lord. Her obedience is being manifest, is manifesting her faith in the Lord's promise and in what the Lord has commanded of her. Now there, you, you, you read about her going and collecting these vessels, and there are those who say, well, in verse 6 it says, and the oil stayed, as if this were negative. You know, the woman could have had so much more if she had only gone and gotten more vessels, but she's cut short because she didn't get enough vessels. That's not at all what the passage says. The passage says that Elisha tells her, do this, and she does it. The emphasis in the passage is on her obedience, complete obedience. And she collects as many vessels as she can. And the oil stays because the Lord has provided the exact amount that he has intended uh, to, to provide. And so this exercise of faith is being worked out in her obedience. And that obedience is a means of actually increasing her faith in the Lord. God doesn't say, you're going to be a spectator. Go sit over here on this hillside and whammo, watch what I'm going to do. But she's rather enlisted as a participant in what God is, is doing. When we trust the Lord's word, and not only as hearers of the word, but doers of the word, we're obeying and walking in the ways that the Lord has given, it, does, it is a means of actually quickening, reinforcing, deepening, strengthening our faith. We're exercising our faith. And just as we strengthen our muscles by exercising them, we strengthen our fa faith in its exercise through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so she's in these desperate circumstances. And the response that, that she's given ultimately is, dry, is, is pulling her eyes upward. She's being led to follow the Lord. What does the Lord say? God speaks through his prophet. She receives that word and she follows the Lord fully like Caleb. She's following the Lord fully in what the Lord has called her to. And this, so the Lord works in his people. He brings us at times to feel acutely our helplessness. We see it. Now there are many times when we refuse to see it. The Lord has to break us but we are brought to see it. And it's in the midst of that helplessness where human ability will not suffice that our eyes are driven to Christ, to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and to be attentive to his word. God speaks to us, of course, through the Bible. And as he speaks to us through the Bible to receive that word in faith, and to obey what the Lord requires of us and to run in the way that he has, has called us. All of this is bolstering our hope uh, in the Lord. But then thirdly, in verse 7, thirdly, we have our heavenly Father. So we're, we're ending on this note of our heavenly Father in verse 7, and you'll see what I mean. In verse 7, then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. We said at the beginning that this text is ultimately about the Lord, not about the woman. And she is being brought in the end with her eyes left on 
God as a God who is a heavenly Father who provides for her. So in Matthew 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about our needs, our need for food, our need for clothing, and so on. In verse 32, he says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus is saying your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things, and he can and will provide. The prophet says four things, go, sell, pay, live. Go, sell, pay, live. And it's the last phrase that I am especially focusing on. And live thou and thy children of the rest, or we could say on the rest, live off of the rest that is left over. So she's going to take, sell the oil, that will be enough to pay off her, her, her creditors, but she has so much oil that there'll be even more that she can sell and then live off that, as it were, an investment. What's happening here? God is not only answering her immediate need. Her immediate need is, I'm going to die. I have no provision for anything. He's not just answering her immediate need. He lavishes abundance upon her. She has an emergency. Her sons are being hauled off to pay her debts. But she also has ongoing need of sustenance. And you see the Lord in his generosity. God is coming in his generosity. And he is is saying, you need this, but it's not enough. I'm going to give you more than what you need. I'm going to give you more than what you have asked for. God has, there's an, an open generosity, a tendency to lavish abundance upon his people to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. Now, lest you think that this should be restricted to our temporal, financial, and physical needs, let me assure you, quite to the contrary, that it applies as well, and even more so, to our souls. This is the God of the gospel. This is the God who shows abundant generosity in dealing with us in the gospel. If you go back to Romans 5, which we looked at this morning in connection with our text in John 14 on the peace, peace with God, go back to that passage, and I want, to, I want you to read a little further than we read this morning. Beginning again at verse 5, notice the catalog of blessings that God gives to the souls of his believing people. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so here he's saying, you have justification, by faith you have peace with God, you have access, by faith you have this grace wherein you stand, you're able to rejoice in the glory of God and so on. But notice at the beginning of verse 3, it's almost like we find in verse 7 of our text, and not only so, the passage says, but we glory in tribulation also. He's saying you have all of these gospel blessings, but, 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 there's even more. He's giving us even above that. He even enables us to do what would be otherwise unthinkable, and that is to glory in tribulation. In other words, God's, when God comes to us in Christ Jesus, Christ has secured for us in his saving work as the Redeemer all that is needed for our body and soul in this world and for all of eternity. He's bought heaven and all of its glory for us as well. And when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we receive him by faith, we are receiving all of the benefits that come with him. And God's goodness then has a tendency to overflow 
It fills up our cup and up 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 it goes until it's pouring over the brim and running down the sides. This is the Lord's way with us. He comes and says, not only are you delivered from hell, but I have gone to prepare a place for you, a kingdom in the presence of my Father in heaven. Not only do you have, are you not under the wrath of God in time, but I give you all of the bounty of eternity. Not only do I forgive your sins and deliver you from the power and domination of sin, but I will also root out and destroy little by little the presence of sin until finally at death it will be eradicated from you altogether. And it's almost as if you can pick any strand. I mean, you can look at this breadth that is found in the gospel and just pick any point, pick one strand. And as you begin to pull it, it keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And there's so much more that it's attached to it. All of this is, is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is a God who deals bountifully in his grace and goodness with his, his people. The Lord is making us to see. He says, and live thou and thy children of the rest. She's being brought to see this is our heavenly father. This is our heavenly father who knows our needs and who cares, who cares and provides for us above and beyond what we might expect. And my friends, this is the privilege of the common Christian. This isn't for the super Christians. This isn't for the, the heroes, the few exceptions that are found here and there in church history. This is the privilege of the common Christian that's reinforced in our text. This widow woman is obscure. Look at the passage. She's nameless. We don't know anything about her other than her immediate, desperate circumstances. She is a nameless, poor, widow woman. And yet she receives from God all of this bounty. Now you compare. Remember, we, we preached our way through 1 Kings. And you take, for example, King Omri, a right? very important king in a very important time in the history of Israel. Go back to 1 Kings. King Omri is given six verses. His whole reign, I mean, he's the king. I mean, he's and in a crucial point in history. God allots six verses of inspired ink to tell us about Omri. This common, obscure, nameless widow woman has more written about her than the king. She's a God-fearing widow. She receives more attention, at least in the, in the, in the Bible, than, than a king did. This is the experience or the privilege of the common Christian, the weak, the overlooked, the disenfranchised, uh, those who, who feel as if they're of no significance in this world. This is how God views that Christian. That kind of Christian. This is how the Lord views you. How are you going to measure importance? I hope you don't measure it by how many times you find yourself in the headlines of modern media. That's no proper measurement of true importance. We should measure it by God's standard, which is given to us in God's word. And this passage reminds us that God's helpless saints matter to him and that he is Jehovah who is able and willing to help and provide divine help for those that are helpless. The Lord says, I will give, I will provide in desperate times for my believing people. And so we are to take our hope in him, to fix our gaze upon him, to find that in Christ we have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. 
These things are located in Christ. So in having Christ, we have every blessing that is to be found in him and in heavenly places. Here, is, here are helpless people being made hopeful because they have a heavenly father who is able to undertake for them. May the Lord strengthen our faith accordingly. Let's stand for prayer. Our Lord and our God, you are a heavenly father to your people. And you are, O oh Lord, aware of all of the complicated circumstances of our lives, our bodies, our souls, our relationships, our connections, our temporal needs. Lord, you are aware of all of these things. You are aware of those occasions in which we're in desperate straits and sense our helplessness. And you have called us to put our hope in Christ. You have called us to find that in having him we have all. That he is our all in all and our full sufficient provision. That we are able, O oh Lord, to, to bring, to, to, to have access to bring all of our burdens to you. The heavy and the difficult. And you, O oh Lord, welcome us. We thank you for your love that you do shed abroad in our hearts. And we pray that you would help us, O oh Lord. We do believe. Help thou our unbelief, we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's sing together from Psalm 66, verses 12 to 17. Psalm 66, verses 12 to 17. The tune is Bangor, which is tune number 29. In verse 16, all that fear God, come, hear, I'll tell what he did for my soul. I with my mouth unto him cried, my tongue did him extol from verse 12 to verse 17.
Let's stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.